Good afternoon. We told you in jury selection it was going to be three weeks, and it's now been two weeks, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, this, is, this is our time for our closing argument. And I'm going to spend some time going through the evidence, um, and I'm going to spend some time going through the elements of the crime. I want you to know that I've been watching you di diligently taking notes and listening. So what I'm not going to do is spend a lot of time repeating everything that was said from the witness stand because I know that you all listened, and I also want you to know that I really appreciate that, and I know the court does too. I told you during jury selection that it wasn't going to be easy, and it was not easy. Listening and watching and thinking about four young kids being gunned down in their school is not easy. You listen to every witness, you examine the evidence, and I suspect that many of you feel the way that we do, that it's difficult. But we owe it to the victims and their families to say what really happened. And you've listened and you've done that. In our system of justice, we have different roles to play, and each role is different. There are people who think it's the prosecutor's job to convict people. I don't think that's the prosecutor's job. I think my job and, and our job is to present, present the evidence and the facts and tell you the truth. And telling the truth sometimes means showing you things none of us want to see, some of us don't agree with, some of us don't like. But I believe that that's my job. We don't pick or choose the very best things because I believe that you should have the truth. And I believe that it's not my job, nor is it right, to sanitize what happened in that school that day. Because if we don't tell you exactly what happened, then you don't know all the facts, and you don't know what the truth is. My job here, our job, that I believe we have done, is to meet our burden to prove that Jennifer Crumbly is guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The burden is high. I told you that during jury selection, but we embrace it. And I believe that we have met that burden. It means that you had to sit and listen to a lot of very emotional things, a lot of emotional people, people who sometimes aren't emotional, but we're emotional for this. Because what happened on that day Every single person in that building had never experienced anything like that in their entire lives. And I hope to God they never do again. So you did see a lot of people, including law enforcement, become overwhelmed with the emotion of it all. That's not a show. That's just how that was. That's how it felt that day and every day after. So I want you to know that there was no picking and choosing the very best evidence to give you. There was no filtering things out that didn't help our case. I showed you everything. And I called witnesses to the stand to say things I knew you probably wouldn't like. But I just, I, I, my job is to give you all the facts. But my job is also to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Jennifer Crumbly is guilty, and I believe we've done that. The defense also has an important job to advocate and argue for their client. And they decide how they want to do that. And of course, the judge plays an important role. Her job is to call balls and strikes. When two sides disagree to make a ruling, and then to tell you what the law is. And she's going to do that as soon as we conclude here. And then there's your job. Your job is to decide what the truth is, what really happened, what are the facts. And then take those facts and find that find the, the truth and apply the law. The judge is going to give you instructions about the law, but I want you to go over what you now what you now know, and I want you to think about it. And we're going to go over some of the evidence. But I also want to remind you 
that you're allowed to use your own observations and your own insight. And if there's something that you notice from the witness stand that I didn't say, you, you, sh you should rely on that. We can't possibly tell you every single little thing. And sometimes, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the most important things are the things that don't get said. The most important things are the way the victim or the witness spoke, the way they answered a question. And I encourage you to rely on your own perceptions of that. I want to start out by talking to you about the elements of the crime. Involuntary manslaughter, she is charged with, this case is based on two theories. You're going to have all this in the jury room, but I'm, hopefully I'm going to explain it so well you will have no questions. Um, these are uh, dependent on, on two specific theories. One is the gross negligence in the performance of a lawful act, and that that gross negligence caused death, and in doing so, the act that caused death defendant acted in a grossly negligent manner. The second is the gross negligence in failing to perform a legal duty. One, I have to prove that there that she had a legal duty to, to the victims. Two, she knew of the facts that gave rise to the duty. Three, she willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty, and her failure to perform it was grossly negligent to human life. And then four, the death of the victims was directly caused by defendant's failure to perform this duty. Causation. The judge is going to instruct you, maybe more than once, and I'm going to say it, that there may be more than one cause of death. And it's not enough that the defendant's acts made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Tate Mir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the defendant's actions. You heard the evidence that the defendant's shot, son shot Madison Baldwin, Tate Mir, Hannah, and Justin. And as previously noted, there may be more than one cause of death. And defendant's acts or inactions need not be the sole cause of the harm. In order to find that the death of Madison, Tate, Hannah, and Justin was caused by the defendant, you must also find beyond a reasonable doubt that her son's act of shooting some these four individuals was reasonably foreseeable. Now you look at that, all of that that I have to prove, and it seems a lot. It seems like it's going to take a pretty strong case to prove that. It's going to take some pretty egregious facts, some unique, egregious, uncomprehensible facts. And that's what we have here. Gross negligence means more than just careless. It means willful disregard the results to other, others that might follow from an act or failure to act. In order to find that the defendant was grossly negligent, you have to find the following three things. One, that she knew of the danger to another. She knew there was a situation that required her to take ordinary care to avoid injuring others. And second, that she could have avoided injuring another by using ordinary care. Third, that she failed to use ordinary care to prevent injury. And, a re and to a reasonable person, it would have been apparent that the result was likely to be serious injury. I told you I have two theories. They're both, they're, we're prosecuting and charging based on two theories. They're both based on a legal duty. What's a legal duty? In Michigan, a parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to control their minor, minor child, to prevent that child from intentionally harming others or prevent that child from conducting themselves in a way that creates an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to others. We talked about there's two alternate theories. Either both of those theories, if proven, are sufficient to establish the crime of involuntary manslaughter. It's not necessary that you all agree on which theory has been proven, and as long as you all agree that, the, that we've proved at least one of those theories beyond a reasonable doubt, you can find her guilty. 
I want to take you through the testimony. Uh, and and I, I again, I am not going to get into every single detail of these testimonies, but each of these witnesses' testimony, because I know that you were listening and you were writing. Um, you heard from Molly Darnell. Molly was a teacher in the school that day. She was in room 224. And she saw the firearm when it was raised, shoulder height, pointed directly at her. And what she noticed was there was no orange tip. You also heard her say that she locked eyes with Jennifer Crumbly's son as he was taking that stance. You heard her testify that she jumped to the right, thank God, just in time, because the shot in her shoulder that she sustained was only inches from her heart. The next witness you heard from was Christy Gibson Marshall, who's an assistant principal at Oxford High School. I don't think there's one, one of us that would disagree that Christy Gibson Marshall did the most dangerous thing she could do. And she did not follow the protocol. It's probably one of the most courageous things I've ever seen. She walked, she walked to the shooter. She saw a student on the floor. And then, when she finally came face to face with the person who had shot this student, she didn't move. She just stared at him. And he, he didn't shoot her. She testified that she knew him. She was his principal in middle school. And she just couldn't believe that he would do something like that because she knew him when, she was in middle, when he was in middle school. You saw the, the, the video of that day and what happened. And he just kept going. And even after he left and she had no idea where he was going, she didn't go <coughs> hide anywhere. She didn't keep herself safe. She bent down to render aid and assistance to that student. And when she rolled him over, she realized it was taken here. We all know that she didn't and wasn't able to save Tate here. We heard from Cammy Bat, who sold the Caltech and the Derringer to James in June of 2021. She also sold the 9mm Six Hour to James with the shooter present on November 26th, the day after Thanksgiving. She testified that James came in and pointed right at the SIG and said he's had his eye on it. She walked us through the process of purchasing a firearm. She talked about the trigger lock statement provided to James upon purchase and the cable lock provided with November 2021 on that gun purchase. Next, we heard from Special Agent Brett Brandon, who's sitting right here. You heard that when he was informed about the Oxford shooting, he left so quickly that when his partner came back, his chair was still spinning. And he raced and drove up there as fast as he possibly could because it was very, it was very much his own community. You heard he went right in and he found Lieutenant Willis and he said, do you know where the gun is and do you know where it came from and do you need help? And so he was responsible for finding out where that gun came from, which he did. He was also responsible because he chose to be and watched the surveillance of the video and helped to prepare search warrants. And you heard him testify that as soon as he saw that surveillance video, the one thing that stuck with him is this is not an inexperienced shooter. This is a shooter that knows how, that is proficient with a firearm. Knows what he's doing. Taking shots, a lot of people wouldn't. And what he did was start going to gun ranges and ask people to say, because what he was thinking was, who taught that kid to, to shoot? He must have been to a range, and he was right. And that's how the investigation led to where Jennifer Crumbly's son, learned how to handle a firearm that eventually resulted in killing 
for students in Oxford High School. Can you go back to that? Special Agent Brandon also testified that the, and, and showed the purchase, and, and we showed you each one of those guns. He testified that there is a distinction between a Derringer, a Caltech, and then the 9mm. And what, he really, what we really heard from him was that that 9mm is a much more dangerous gun. It causes more damage to whatever it hits. The bullets are a larger caliber, and it's a very dangerous weapon. He, he showed you what comes with every gun purchase, which is the ATF pamphlet. He read to you about the warnings. There's a reason they put it in every single gun purchase. And its sole purpose is to protect kids from gun violence deaths. He talked to you about what a trigger lock is a tr and, the, and the trigger lock statement. He showed you the Instagram post that's unforgettable. We don't have to really argue about whose gun that was. Jennifer Crumbly told us whose gun that was. She told us when she posted on social media, it was his Christmas present, and she told you in this trial. That weapon is not just that weapon. It is the defendant's son's gun. It was gifted to him. And not only was it gifted to him, she bragged about it on social media before the shooting. Special Agent Brandon also introduced all of the surveillance and the, the videos of the, um, shoot, the shooting range. And you got to see with your very own eyes the training and the, the preparation that the shooter ultimately used to kill four of his classmates. We all saw that. We actually saw the last day he was practicing to kill four of his classmates. And there was only one person with him, ladies and gentlemen, and her name is Jennifer Crumbly. And I want you to, to remember that video. And I want you to remember the look on his face when that target comes back in and he looks at it and he's smiling. Special Agent Brandon also introduced the worksheet. You've seen the worksheet a lot. I bet you that worksheet's burned in your, your memory and I wouldn't even have to show it to you. But what, what Special Agent Brandon testified to and showed you is that that wasn't just a picture of any gun. It was a, it was a picture of his gun, which was the murder weapon. And he showed you the details, and we're going to talk about that later. And next, we, we heard from uh, Ed Wagrowski. We, we, we now just call him Ed because he works with the Secret Service. Um, and he testified for an entire day, and he, he had a lot of information. But he also really couldn't help himself from becoming emotional. And I, I, I know that you're going to remember this, but what an extraordinary thing that's just not seen very often. He sat right there, and he took you through every single action of the shooter and every single death from his memory. And he told you that he could do that because it's burned in his brain. These are seasoned law enforcement this isn't an act. They hate showing emotion. He probably will never forgive me. Lieutenant Willis tells me all the time how much he really hates me. Right, I would object. Uh, it's my opening. It's, it's my closing. You're to what a witness it. tells her all the time that's not evidence. Okay. I'll move on. Okay. Nobody likes doing that. Nobody likes doing that. But it tells you something about what it was like that day. And, and despite what any, anybody will tell you, it is about the shooting. It's, there are four counts of involuntary manslaughter. It's very much about the shooting. Because the shooter learned how to shoot and was given the murder weapon 
by his parents. And this parent is sitting here today on trial. Okay. You'll be able to review the evidence. It was a lot. But he talked to you about what cell phone um, extractions are. And because of the cell phone extractions, we have a mountain of evidence that you saw. And yes, it's a lot of data. But do you know what else it is? It's telling you exactly where the defendant was, who she was talking to, what she did, what she didn't do. And, there, and you can't hide from that. She tried. There's a lot of deleted messages, which are not coincidental. I don't think I, I don't think any of you believe that, but I'm, I'm going to tell you why they're not coincidental. Uh, he also talked to us about and showed you the messages between Jennifer Crumbly and her son. The messages between Jennifer, her son and his only friend. He introduced the voicemail that Jennifer Crumbly received the night before the shooting about looking up bullets. True. Pam Fine didn't tell her to call back. That's true. And she didn't call back because she didn't ask for a call back. We all know what she did do with that information. What she did do with that information is she texted her son, searching bullets. And we all know the, the phrases that we'll never forget. Did you show him your gun? This is the day before the shooting. Did you show him your gun? And the shooter responds, no, my God. LOL, I'm not mad. You just have to learn not to get caught. <coughs> Kira Pennant testified that she knew Jennifer Crumbly. She testified about the amount of time that Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly spent at the barn. She testified about all the money they spent at the barn. Why is this important, ladies and gentlemen? It's, 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 not, it's not to show you that somebody's a bad person for liking horses or spending a lot of money on horses. It isn't. And it's, and it's not to say that somebody should spend every waking hour that they're not at work at home with their teenager. That's, that's not the purpose of this evidence. The purpose of this evidence is to show you what Jennifer Crumbly cared about the most and what she was doing and where she was when her son learned to be a killer. <clears throat> Kira will tell you that she referred to her son as an oopsie baby and said he was weird. She rarely saw him. Uh, and that even after the one friend was taken away abruptly with no notice, they, they still went to the barn even at night and left him by himself. Which is absolutely normal to leave teenagers at home by themselves. Unless, unless that teenager is showing signs of mental crisis and that teenager has lost the only person in the world that he has. And then she, she told us that when she got the worksheet texted to her that day by Jennifer Crumbly, she was very concerned. She was alarmed. And in fact, she said, bring him to the barn. And you also heard from the, saw from the text messages that Jennifer Crumbly said, he can't be alone. We know now that decision, that, that statement, she, she knew he couldn't be alone. She didn't decide to stay home with her son. That wasn't an option. She'd have to take him to the barn, where she herself testified he didn't want to go. <coughs> you heard from two people who were at that meeting that day, Sean Hopkins and Nick Ejet. I'm going to tell you right now that this is not an argument as that the school did everything they should have done. I'm not going to say that to you. I'm not going to tell you that I like everything they testified to. I'm not going to tell you that I think it was okay they didn't look in the backpack. I don't think it was. But this is about Jennifer Crumley's actions. And any attempt 
to make it about what these two individuals did or didn't do, like it or not, who did not have any of the information that was so jarring, it's about what she knew and what she didn't say. Sean Hopkins testified that he was concerned enough that he called Jennifer Crumbly. And her first response is, can you call his dad? Eventually, he, get, he, he emails her both copies of the worksheet, the original worksheet and the worksheet that was um, scribbled on. And she eventually comes to the school. But before she comes to the school, she texts her husband, emergency, emergency. Along with, I'm very concerned. And James texts back, WTF. They're concerned. For the first time she testified ever, they're called to the school in the middle of the day, and they have that worksheet. Sean Hopkins is going to tell you that calling parents in the middle of the day and asking them to get a kid help is a pretty drastic action. And that he did, in fact, do that. And he gave them the list of places to call. He testified that when they entered the room, Jennifer Crumley didn't greet her son. Jennifer Crumley didn't hug her son. Jennifer Crumley didn't engage with her son at all in the entire 11 minutes she was there. And we know she wasn't going to be in that school very long because she'd already told her boss she'll be back by 12 or 12.30. Doesn't leave a lot of time to, for the meeting at the school. It's a 20-minute drive. Sean Hopkins will tell you that what he felt mostly in that room for the shooter was compassion. He didn't want him to be alone, and he felt really bad. And, and he also knew mom and dad decided, no, I, we can't take it. We have to go to work. They said that in front of their kid. He knows very well what they do. He knows his dad works for DoorDash. He knows his mom and her, and her ability to work flexible hours. She worked at home. But they left. She did not hug him goodbye. She did not greet, touch, or even acknowledge him. And we know now from her testimony we know why. She was mad. She was mad at him. She, didn't, she, she did not think that he should have done that, and she thought this was a discipline thing, and she was very angry. We heard from Nick Ejek. He's the dean of students. He also testified and corroborated what Sean Hopkins told you, which is that the meeting was called. They were concerned about a mental health issue. They told mom and dad he needs um, he needs services. Here's a list of the services, and they they defend the Jennifer Crumley seemed irritated by it. In fact, when she walks into the room, she doesn't sit next to her son. She goes back here and stands. And that meeting ended with her saying, are we done here? They're consistent about that. Nick E.J. testified he didn't think there was any risk. I don't like what he said, and I knew he was going to say it. But it's not my job to put witnesses up here and only say things that I want them to say that helps my case. It's my job to present evidence that's the truth. Because you have to know the truth. Sergeant Joseph Bryan is the first law enforcement that had contact with Jennifer Crumbly and her husband right after the shooting. And you saw the interview in the substation. And you saw the demeanor of the defendant. I, I want you to remember something. It wasn't even an hour. It was around an hour after the shooting took place. She's on her cell phone. She's looking to see if it's on the news, she said. We also know that there were deleted messages. We don't know when she deleted them, but we know there were messages deleted after the time of the shooting 
from the time that the phones were, were seized later that night. He asked about the gun. And you heard what she said, what they both said. It was hidden. It was hidden. She read the text message. Oh, he said he loved me. And she reads a text message. And then she said, I texted him, I love you back. It was 49 minutes later that she texted, I love you back. And it was after she already knew that he was the shooter. She doesn't say what the text after that is. She leaves that out. The text after that is, Ethan, don't do it. She doesn't say, well, we were at the school, but, but we, he was also caught searching bullets that night, the night before. She doesn't say that, and I told him, don't worry about it, you just, have to, just don't get caught. She doesn't say that they had just purchased the weapon and it's not secure. What do they say? The very first time they are asked about, what Jennifer Cummings asked, what, where was this gun? The very first time, what does she say? It was hidden. She does not say there was any locking mechanism at all, and neither does James. It was hidden. You're at the police station. Your son's in the next room. You know the murder weapon was the weapon you just purchased for him, and when you're asked where it was, you say it was hidden. We also heard from Andy Smith, who was Jennifer's boss. He testified she could have absolutely gone home. She works from home um, and there's flexibility, that they have kids that come to work, that the meeting that she wanted to get to was not in any way mandatory. And he testified about some very bizarre communications. He testified that as soon as she left, he got a text saying, uh, my son, the bullets are gone, the gun is gone. He, he must be the shooter. Oh my God. Those, those were deleted by Jennifer Crumbly. We don't know why. I think there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest why, which is those are statements you don't want on your phone. And then, not three hours after her son shot and killed four people, and he's already in custody, and it's already clear that he is probably never, ever, ever going to be out of prison for the rest of his life. She's texting, don't judge me based on what he did. I need my job. Her explanation for that, she was in planning mode. The next witness is Amanda Holland, who testified that she came back to the, to the uh, work that day. She had the worksheet. Um, Andy Smith also said she, she, before the shooting occurred, she was down, she was sad, I feel like a failure as a parent. I feel like a failure as a parent. This is before the shooting. And she also tells Amanda about this, and she tells Amanda he can't be alone, so I'm just going to take him to the barn tonight. We can get to it a little bit later. I guess what's really hard to comprehend is how, before the shooting, just based on the meeting and what she knows and the drawing, she thinks she's a failure of a parent. But she sat right here and said, after all, she doesn't really think she was a failure as a parent. And that's after she knows everything that happened. Detective Adam Stoyak executed the search warrant at the defendant's home. I want to make it really clear. Jennifer Crumley's not being charged with involuntary manslaughter because she has a dirty house. That's absurd. And you can see pictures so we can prove that she didn't have her house clean. I don't care if her house is clean or not, and I don't think you do either. Those pictures are shown to you because this, that is where the shooter lived and it's where she lived. And you saw his two bedrooms. There was barely a place for him to sleep. The testimony shows he had no, no person in his life after that friend left. He was not in a club. He was not in sports. He wasn't working. 
when I see those photos, what I think is, yeah, two rooms that were completely filthy, dusty, covered with clothes everywhere. But then, I think, what? That is where he spent 99% of his time. It's where he ate Thanksgiving dinner, just days before the shooting. The search warrant photos were also shown to you so you could understand where these guns were stored. We have a pretty good idea that the Caltech and the Derringer were in what's called the gun safe. The lock was 000, but we know that they were kept there. What do we know about the SIG, the, the Jennifer Crumbly's son's gun? We know that there was a box on the bed and the ammunition next to it. This is the box. This is the box. I'm sorry, this is the, the thing. Can you get that other box? I'm just going to show you in a minute. This is, this is the box of the Caltech, which was found with this cable lock inside of it, where she kept the other guns now. I'm sorry, is that the box or the cave? Is that the box or the safe? This is the box. This is the box. It was in the kitchen, <coughs> in a cupboard, down sorry, in, the, in the cupboard. But the empty box was in the kitchen, right? Um, I don't um, what the picture is. Your this is my closing argument, and I would just like to finish, please. Sure, can you tell us what the number it is? Yes, it is 35. Go ahead. This was found in the kitchen. Inside is a cable lock. This was found on the end of the defendant's bed. Special Agent Brandon showed you what it's like to open this up and close it. You hear that clap? It's not an easy thing. So what this, this is laid out on the defendant's bed and the bullets are right next, the box of the ammunition is right next to it, empty. The story, one of the, one of the stories that is told by Jennifer Crumbly is he must have come in there when they were sleeping because she was in that bed all night long and they left after her. Except that the ammunition was in the box. Taking it out and leaving the box while your parents are sleeping doesn't make a lot of sense. And it doesn't make a lot of sense that this was taken, that the weapon was taken out of this case with no one hearing while they were sleeping. And you are allowed to use your own common sense. He also testified about the search warrant, he testified where this cable lock was found, and he testified where the, where the case and the box was found, and he testified where the gun safe was found. It was not unlike what Jennifer Crumbly alleged, stored separately from the ammunition, it was actually right next to the ammunition. In a gun safe, the other two guns, with a combination 000. Sergeant Peschke arrives at the scene, doesn't know anything about the Crumbleys, doesn't know that they've already been to the substation, doesn't know that they were at the school that day. He's there and was asked, was ordered to be there to uh, keep the house safe while they are waiting for the search warrant. And in doing so, he needs to keep the de defendant out of the house. She goes in the back of the car, and you saw the video. She now tells Sergeant Pes Peschke she actually never looked, really looked closely at that worksheet. Now that she looks at it, it might be disturbing. We know that's not the truth. The question is, why is she lying? She says that the 45 caliber gun used at the school and tells, he asks if it was, and, and tells him, no, it was a 9 millimeter. The other is a 22, I think. She said that they had a fight the night before with her son over grades. And she says, so we told him, no gun rage, no fun. Those are his trigger points. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone was never taken away from her son. We know that. We know that because he had it the night before and he had it at the school. We know that because when Jennifer Crumbly was asked about it and asked, when did you take this phone away? 
we know that he made that video in that shed about the school shooting with his phone at 10 o'clock. The, 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 the phone was never taken away. Why is she saying that? I don't know. Then she says, my biggest fear was that he turned the gun on himself. And when he asked her, do you ever keep guns in your car? Here's what she did. Sugar head. It's not what she says here today. Next, we heard from Bob Catalas, who processed the scene. <coughs> and you saw those pictures, and they were hard to see. He told you that there were 32 fired cartridge casings. He collected all that evidence, took all the photographs, and, and recovered the murder weapon. Lieutenant Narsvan was also at the school that day, and he testified that he picked up the phone and saw the screen and saw that the last text was, Ethan, don't do it, from mom. He executes search warrants for all of the devices and the home and sends a, a team, including Officer Peschke, to, to, to secure the house before the search warrant is executed, which is what they do. He testified that when he went into the house, he finally got there and he needed their phones. And he testified that Jennifer promptly said, no, I don't want to give you my phone. I'm not giving you my phone. She finally relents because her husband says they're going to get it either way. And then she doesn't want to give the passcode up. She doesn't want to give the phone up. But the most important thing that Lieutenant Marsman said is when he described how he had to identify the body of Hannah in Madison that day. Dave Hendrick is retired, but he's the former sergeant in charge of the fugitive, fugitive apprehension team we call FAT. And his job, his only job, when he was doing that, is to find people who have felony warrants and haven't, show, haven't turned up. He has a lot of ways to figure that out. But he was asked to find Jennifer and James Crumbly to make sure they turn themselves in. But one of the other primary goals he has is that they turn themselves in safely. And she was given every opportunity to do that, and she did not. I want to talk to you about something. The judge is going to instruct you, instruct you that you can consider flight. It's not an element to the crime. I don't have to prove that they fled. The reason we introduce this evidence is she's going to instruct you, instruct you that you can use that as a sign of consciousness of guilt. What do you do if you know you've done something wrong? You can, you can use that to show consciousness of guilt. And we're going to get to it, but I believe we have shown that beyond a reasonable doubt. He's going to tell you that the defendant with her husband immediately began to uh, avoid detection because they're pulling cash out. They're pulling cash out of their son's bank account. They're pulling cash out of their bank account. Where's her son during this time? He's at Children's Village being arraigned with this court-appointed lawyer where they had the opportunity to go see him, where they had the opportunity to go to that arraignment, and they did not because they never even went. They, they fled their house and went to a hotel and then they ended up at an extended stay, and that is where they ultimately left one of the Kias, backed into a parking space. He's going to tell you that he eventually did apprehend the defendant. You've heard a lot about that. And he's going to tell you that there were hundreds of law enforcement officials on the scene when she was apprehended. Luke Kirtley, I know you will not forget him, uh, coincidentally knew a lot about cars and coincidentally pulled into that parking lot right about the time and coincidentally had just seen the, the, the wanted poster, he called it, and with a description of the cars and, and a photo of the defendant. And coincidentally thought, maybe that's the car. And you watch the video where he goes around and he sees the license plate and he plays it cool, 
and, and, and slowly walks into the building and then makes the call to 911. He describes to you how within minutes, police officers arrived and then it, it swarms of, of law enforcement arrived, SWAT, the marshals, uh, ATF, the sheriff's department, Detroit uh, PD, all sorts of law enforcement show up immediately. He also testified that the unit where the where Jennifer Pumley was actually found was very close to his, and it faced the parking lot, and the whole wall was windows, and it was on the first floor. And he's going to tell you that the whole parking lot was lit up with law enforcement, lights, sirens, all kinds of things. Next, we heard from Captain Cor Corporal David Shaw, <coughs> and he testified that once he got there, they took a 35-pound ram to breach the door, which was right outside the unit where the defendant was found. We heard from Brian Deloche. Also, didn't love a lot of things he has to say, but you deserve to know the truth. And the truth is, like it or not, this is who Jennifer Crumley spent her time with, and she told him that morning, the gun's in my car, and I'm afraid my, my son's gonna do something stupid. Before the shooting, the same day. You also learned that although their Facebook thread in general was always deleted, post after the uh, shooting it remained, except she deleted, not unsent, rely on your own memory about what that testimony was. Those were not unsent messages, they were deleted, and you heard Edward Grouse tell you that. But these were the two that were deleted, on the run again, and were fucked. William Freer testified what was found in the, 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 uh, the building and the art studio where Jennifer Crumbly was found. You saw the photographs. You learned that there was six, a little over $6,000 in cash. You learned where the phones were found and the cash and the purse in the plastic tub, in a, another plastic tub with the lid on it far away from far feet away from where the mattress was and their other things were and you learned all those phones were off. He also testified what else was found. Booze, orange juice, ice and avocado, bananas, socks, blankets. And that is the room where the where Jennifer Crumbly was ultimately apprehended. You heard from Lieutenant Willis, who was the officer in charge. He told you what it was like in the school that day. He described the autopsy protocols that were done and how each of those kids died and where they were shot. He told you that both Justin Schilling and Madison Baldwin were shot at in a contact wound, which means the gun was either very close or actually touching their head. He showed you the video of the shooting. And again, this is not this is not to incite emotion. The video of the shooting shows Jennifer Crumbly's son taking a stance he clearly knew how to take and was trained to take. And you watched his demeanor and the calculated cold way he proceeded through those hallways looking for people to shoot. You saw uh, the surveillance of how he ultimately surrendered. Walked out after executing Justin Schilling, laid the gun on a waste paper basket, made it safe, took the magazine out, and surrendered. He showed you and introduced the bank records that show you what they were doing after charges were either very soon coming and after they were announced. And he showed you an in-car video of Jennifer Crumbly and her husband. 
who just a few hours after the shooting embraced, kissed, whatever happens, I love you, don't say anything to the police. One of the elements we have to prove is what a person using ordinary care would have known about whether or not there was a situation that they needed to exercise ordinary care. So the defendant's knowledge about her son matters. But it's two different stories. It's what she knew before the shooting, and it's what she know, what she said she knew after. Before the shooting, she, she tells Kira, my son's weird. She always refers to him as an oopsie baby. She tells Amanda Holland he's lonely. He's hearing things around the house sometimes. She says, I'm a failure as a parent. The message to her, her son's friend's mother, he's kind of depressed in April. She texts that. And then the messages from her son. The messages in March about he's seeing things. Things are flying off the table. Now she wants to tell you that was just a joke, but I don't, I, I think you really need to consider whether a 15 year old boy is going to text, could you at least answer me or reply to my text as a joke? And we know there were no replies. There were missed calls, he called her. There were no replies. And she told us why. He was just messing around. But after the shooting, in the in-car, we hear her say, he's never been in trouble, he's never done anything, he's never done anything wrong, he's a good kid. Also in the in-car, I never even thought like he would have any mental issues, like I never, that he never, he never exerted any type of anger, he's never exerted anything, he's just like one of those mellow, laid-back kids. In the substation, he's never done anything, he's never done anything bad. After the shooting to, to Brian Lowe, she's never done anything wrong. <coughs> Jennifer Crumbly has said a lot of things about that drawing and that meeting at the school. She sent the drawing to James as I, and Kira and Andrew, as I said before, with the call now, emergency. She told Kara he couldn't be left alone. She tells Andy he needs to get she needs to get him counseling, and she tells Amanda that she uh, the drawing was really scary. She agrees. After this is what she says in the substation. It, the school, nobody see, didn't seem worried about it, and he said that the, my son's more than welcome to stay at the school, or he could go home. And I really wish we I really wish we had taken him home. In the in-car, she said, I didn't even look at that closely. Now that I do, uh, when I was at the substation, I looked at it closely, which we know is not true. Um, I looked at them closely, and they're a little disturbing. Well, they're very disturbing, because look what he just fucking did. And then to Malo, she says, the school was very nonchalant, but the paper they showed me had all of the things scratched out. That's just not true. That's just not true. And you don't have to believe me, because we have evidence it's not true. And you heard it. The statements about the gun are also <coughs> numerous. She said, we've heard her testify the gun was in her car. We know that she's acknowledged that she drove to the gun range. There was no lock on the gun when she drove there. She returned with the gun. There was no lock on it. But she said James locked the gun when he got home. She didn't see him do it. She testifies at trial. James is responsible for the gun. In the substation, though, when asked where the gun was, hidden. In the in-car interview, James flew home and he's like, I, I had the gun hidden and I told him where I hid the bullets. He asked whether she kept the gun in her car. She shakes her head no. And she tells Veloche after, the next day, we had the string lock on it. It came within the case. 
Everything was secured, not loaded, bullets stored, separately. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That is not what she says in the substitution. Jennifer Crumby begins distancing herself from her own responsibility about the gun. You heard her testify that they wanted to get the gun. It was my son and my husband. My son did a lot of research on the gun. I guess I was, um, I guess when I was shopping. She doesn't say she didn't know. She doesn't say that she didn't approve. She says it really interfered with going to get Christmas trees. That was what she was upset about. And she said, it's James's responsibility. However, as I've shown over and over, at the substation and in the car, it's we. It's we take him to the range. We, it's our hobby. We go to the gun range. That's what we do. We just got him this gun. Sitting here today, it's all James' fault. It's not us. And then, of course, the statement that we don't really have to question whose, whose weapon it was. Jennifer Crumbly posts, Ethan and James Crumbly both got handguns this week, testing them out at the range. That's in June. The evidence really shows that the shooter owned two guns. But for sure, she acknowledges Mom and Sunday testing out his new Christmas present. You heard evidence that was presented to you about the journal that was found in the bathroom by the shooter's backpack, right before the bathroom that he exited and started shooting. I have zero help from my mental problems and it's causing me to shoot up the fucking school. Next slide. First off, I got my gun. It's an SP2022 Sig Sauer 9mm. The shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and the ammo. I am fully committed to this. So yeah, I'm, gonna pris I'm going to prison for the rest of my life and many people have, are about, have about one day to live. One of the things I want you to ask yourself when you go back in that room is why, why, after hearing that there's an active shooter situation and knowing that your son is involved, you are taking the time to delete text messages and look at the messages that were deleted. We're on the run again. Helicopters not sure where to, I'll message you, and we're fucked. Delete. The gun is gone and so are the bullets. Oh my God, Andy, he's going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. Ethan did it. Those were deleted from her phone. She deletes all the things she says about the drawing to Kira. Including making sure that she still was going to get her lesson that night. This is the timeline from when the, in March, which you've, you've heard a lot of testimony starting in about March, was where we first have evidence that he was struggling, he was hallucinating, he was seeing things, and he wanted her to text back, and she didn't. We know that he had some incident, and he said that the mental breakdown in April, you saw text messages between James and Jennifer saying, did he say anything about last night? He, did, he woke up in our bed, he didn't know where he was. We, we don't know what that was about, but we certainly know that that is not evidence of somebody who is completely fine and stable. In fact, lots of messages from Jennifer Crumbly saying, I'm worried. I'm worried he's going to do something stupid. In April, she texts her friend that she thinks he's depressed. The Caltech and the Danger was purchased in June. They go to the shooting range in June. The, they go to the shooting range in August. They go to the shooting range in September, and then in November, you, they buy the Sig Sauer, and we see the shooting range that Jennifer Crumbly went to with her son, testing out his new Christmas present. Here's what we learned Jennifer Crumbly did after the shooting. As soon as they took her phone, they bought burner phones in the pier at 8 o'clock the night of the shooting. They checked into a Holiday Inn Express that night in the pier. 
They then left and went to an extended stay in Auburn Hills, which Lieutenant Willis testified was almost across the street from a police department. Um, upon learning that uh, charges were uh, possibly coming, and the same day charges were announced, they leave that hotel and drive to Detroit. They withdrew 2,000 from a Flagstar bank at, um, on December 2nd. They drive to Owasso an hour away, she says, because we just didn't want anyone to recognize us, to buy replacement phones. She texts that she's on the run again. Helicopters are not sure where I'll message you to at 7.31 a.m. on December 2nd. She texts on December 2nd, we're fucked at 2 o'clock. On December 3rd, at 4.59 a.m., she texts, I'd rather die than go to jail. Then she withdraws $4,000 from another Flagstar on December 3rd. She checks out of the extended stay on the 3rd and drives down and arrives at uh, Bellevue at 10.58 on December 3rd. You heard what happened. You heard her testimony. The, the, the facts do not support the story that Jennifer Crumbly told you. They just don't. <clears throat> there is no possible way, and Luke told you that, and so did uh, Corporal Shaw, that it would you could be in that building with that many law enforcement and not know that somebody was there. And we don't even have to use that to his testimony, ladies and gentlemen, because she texted herself I think we're caught, we're laying low. She texts that, we find out, and this is evidence we got this morning. She texts that after she's already said she, she took four Xanax and went to sleep. Now you saw that video. You saw that video. All those people, for over two hours, they're sleeping, and even when they come into the room, they still don't even act like they get up. It's just not true. And we know it's not true because they'd already taken steps. She had hidden the phones, powered them down, separate from all the other things they had with the cash. <coughs> Jennifer probably wants you to believe that if only the school had done something different, we wouldn't be here. If only the school. Well, let's talk about what she knew that, that no school employee knew. She knew about the, the text messages in March that he was a, about a demon, throwing bowls, clothes flying off the shelf. She knew about the March 18th incident of waking up in his parents' bedroom and like he had way too much to drink and asking why he was in their room. She knew he had previously asked for help and, and, and to go to the doctor, and she laughed at him. She knew there were multiple guns in the home. She knew her son had been gifted a gun just a few days before the shooting. She had posted it on Instagram. But apparently, it's absolutely fine for all your Instagram friends to know that you got him a Christmas present with a 9 millimeter handgun, but it's not okay or relevant to the people sitting in that room with that drum. She knew that that gun looked identical to the one in the drawing. She knew that the gun was accessible to him. She knew it wasn't stored properly. She knew that he was proficient with the gun. She knew he had, um, he had access to ammunition. And she knew that her son was upset the night before. Now, that says he was locked out. She told Amanda Holland he, he got locked out. She doesn't acknowledge that. She does acknowledge that he did Leave, leave the, the house that night because he was upset. And we all know what he did. We all know what he did. He went to that shed and recorded Your that Honor, video. I object. That video did not come into evidence. Okay, it is in mm -hmm. evidence. Okay. Not, you're right. That's, that's true. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's go back to the elements. The ordinary care. What ordinary care the smallest tragically smallest thing could have done, she could have done to prevent this. 
She could have stopped at home on the way back from the meeting. She goes right by her home to see where the gun was. She could have stopped on, on the way back to work. She could have searched the backpack. She could have asked her son where the gun was. She could have locked the ammunition. She could have locked the gun. She could have taken him home. She could have taken him to work. He could have gone with dad. He was door dashing. She could have told the school that they just gifted him a gun. She could have embraced her son. She could have said, can, you, can we talk to him for a minute alone? She could have looked at him and said, I care about you, I love you. She could have at least acknowledged he was in the room. She could have told the school about her son being in crisis previously and asking for help. Ordinary care would have included all of those things. And the tragic part about it is none of it was hard. None of it. The smallest thing, just the smallest thing, could have saved Hannah and Tate and Justin and Madison. The smallest of things. I have to prove that there's reasonable foreseeability. And, and that worksheet right there that Jennifer Crumbly saw just hours before the shooting is reasonable foreseeability. And we're going to show you in the next slide. <clears throat> That's the picture of the gun. It's not just on the end gun, ladies and gentlemen. It's the gun that they just gave him. Blood everywhere. That's what he wrote with ammunition. I didn't show you the picture with the blood because I don't think you need to see it again. But we know what happened in that school and in that hallway. Here's a picture with two bullet holes and blood coming out of the figure's head. And look at that. That is where those shots went. Those, those are from the shooter's gun. The thoughts won't stop. Help me. These are all of the things that were texted to Jennifer Crumbly. This was in March. But he's writing it on a piece of paper, and he's showing it to her. That is foreseeable. He's... he's telling in that drawing this is the gun that was purchased for me help me blood everywhere the world is dead I know you won't ever forget the video but when you if you look at the, at the defendant's son and see that there was no emotion none he, he was only concerned in a very calm manner as fi for finding as many people as he could to kill. And he did. My life is useless. <coughs> These statements from the defendant's son are just heartbreaking. I actually gave my... I, I actually... Gave my, asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he said, just gave me, give me some pills and told me to suck it up. Like, it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor. My mom laughed when I told her. But I am having bad insomnia right now. I need help. I was thinking I, I, I could call 911 so I could go to the hospital. But then my parents would be really pissed. Like, I am mentally and physically dying. Let's talk about the cable lock. Jennifer Crumbly says that the cable, the, the weapon was uh, used, and it, but it was, it was locked in a cable lock that came with the case. This cable lock? This cable lock that came is, is, the, is the cable lock that came in that case with the SIG. It's never been opened, and it's never been used. This is the last picture 
that we have of that gun until we see it murder four kids on November 30th. And the person holding it is Jennifer Crumbly. She's the last person that we see with that gun. She's the person that said it was in her car, then she said it was in her house, it was her husband's responsibility, it wasn't hers. That's what she told you. She knew he was distraught the night before. He got, he texted her, I love you. She told you that's never happened before. She did think it was abnormal or odd. She knew he was looking up bullets in the school. She knew he was watching violent videos. She knew he was proficient with guns. She knew he was previously in crisis. She knew his only friend that he talked to was just gone. She knew all those things. And then his own state, her own statements, ladies and gentlemen, when she took the stand. She testified that when she's looking back, she still wouldn't do one thing different. Not one. Not any of those small, those tragically small things. Even now, she told you she wouldn't do anything different. And then she also told you that we took his gun away. You heard her say it. And then she said, she doesn't think of herself a victim, but she has lost everything. You're gonna hear the instructions from the judge, and you're gonna take the facts, and the witnesses, and the evidence, and use what you promised to use, which is impartial, honest assessment, and find what you believe the facts are in this case. The flight, evidence of the flight and what they did after is not an element I have to prove. But what does it show? It shows the minute this shooting became public, and ended up in the paper, in the media. Jennifer Crumbly started telling a story and then she ran. And she didn't run just because she was selfish, ladies and gentlemen. She ran and she started deleting text messages and she started telling a different story because she knew she had done something wrong. That's the only reason you start deleting text messages. It's the only reason that you start saying something that isn't true. It just isn't <clears throat> true. Jennifer Crumbly drove to Detroit with a, a, a bunch of cash and six cell phones powered off. You can consider that as consciousness of guilt. Everything she did from the time she found out that there was an active shooter and had the 10 minute call with her husband. They both say they went right, he, he, he called 911 right, 911 right away. He did not. He talked to his wife for 10 minutes, over 10 minutes on the phone before he called 911. But the facts changed because it was the immediate attempt to misrepresent what actually happened. Why, why is a mother whose son just killed four people thinking about deleting her text messages? Why is she saying things that are not true about her son? Why does she care about her job? Why does she care about her horse lesson? Why does she care about any of these things? Because she knew she did something wrong and she's deleting all of those things because she wants you to believe that she's somebody she's not. And you know what she's not? She is not somebody that used ordinary care to prevent what was foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable, that could have happened. Injury or death, and it did. It did. Those words on that paper helped me. 
she walked out of that school within 11 minutes, didn't so much even, even address her son. She did not give him the help that he wanted. And you can argue about the months before and the weeks before, but if you just even look at what happened that day, she walked out of that school and she knew, she knew something bad might happen. What does she do when she gets back to work? She all of a sudden texts her son, are you okay? You know, you can talk to us. These are the actions of somebody who was worried. She was worried and she was concerned and she was panicked until after. And then it's a different story. Why? Because she knew she had done something wrong. She walked out of that school when just the smallest, smallest of things could have saved, could have helped Hannah and Tate and Madison and Justin. Just the smallest of things. And not only did she not do it, she doesn't even regret it. We have proven beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. It's a rare case to take some really egregious facts. It takes the unthinkable. And she has done the unthinkable. And because of that, four kids have died. So I'm asking you to go back when you hear the law, review the evidence, and find her guilty because we have proven our verdict. Thank you.